In this episode, you're going to learn about the big power you have as a service designer and the important responsibility that comes along with that. You'll also learn about how you can become a better designer by building bridges and finally, what it means to shape service design, to shape the future of service design in an intentional way. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. I'm Yoko. This is the Service Design Show episode number 98. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is the general co-chair of the Service Desk 2020 conference. She's the co-founder of the Service Design Melbourne meetup. Her name is Yoko Akama. The reason I'm so excited to have Yoko on the show is that she challenges some of the dominant forces within service design and strongly argues for a more diverse and inclusive practice. So at the end of this episode, you'll probably have learned about some of your own biases and how those impact the work you do as a designer. Before we dive into the chat with Yoko, don't forget that we post at least one new video a week here on this channel to help to level up your service design skills. So if you haven't done so already, click that subscribe button and the, that bell icon to be notified when new videos come out. So that's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the chat with Yoko Akama. Welcome to the show, Yoko. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, happy to have you on all. You're literally at the other side of the world because you're in Melbourne right now, right? Yes. Yeah. And Melbourne's at the bottom of Australia. Yeah, and I, I think if we would just dig a hole straight through the earth, I would end up somewhere in Australia. Uh, quite Yoko. possibly, yeah. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, Yoko, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give a brief introduction? Uh, okay, hello. Um, my name is Yoko Akama. I'm a design researcher from the School of Design at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Cool. Uh, and I, in the introduction, I already said something about the ServDesk conference. Uh, what's the current state of that? Yeah, so because of the um, global pandemic, we had to postpone the conference from uh, being scheduled. It was scheduled for July 6th and 9th, but we're looking at a future date at the, at the current time. Mm -hmm. And it would be the first edition of ServDesk going uh outside of europe right yeah it's the first time uh, asia pacific is hosting it so mm. we're very excited let's hope it happens yeah me too yeah a lot of thoughts gone into it already i can imagine yeah um yoko like <clears throat> it was quite interesting when uh i approached you or got connected to you for uh the show you had some reservations. You said, I, I'm not sure if I'm actually the right person to talk about service design. I have some uh, uh, a different perspective on, on, on it. And then I, uh, then I said to you, different perspectives are more than welcome. And we'll talk about that later. But I'm first of all interested in, do you remember the first moment that you sort of got in touch with the term of service design? Where, when did you start learning, thinking and speaking about service design? Um, I think it was when I was doing my PhD. Um, so that was um, so long. You can, t you can see my gray hair. It was so <laughs> long ago. Um, and it might have been when I bumped into uh, Lucy Kimball um, at a conference um, in Europe. And uh, we met because she came to our presentation, something on human-centered design. I can't remember when it, what it was about. And she said uh, I should meet with um, Ben Reason at LibWork and interview him for my PhD. Mm. Um, and so that made, I think that was 2005, no, six. Mm. Mm. I can't remember, something like that. The early days of service design, at least. The, the, the modern early days of service design. Cool. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, definitely. Um, like I just said, you have a different perspective on, on service design, which is really good. And I would love to dig into that with you through our interview jazz format. So 
Mm -hmm. Are you ready to do it? Yes. All right. We're going to talk about a topic. We're going to start with a topic that's been discussed um, uh, often in the past few episodes, which is really good. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about ethics. Do you have a question starter and can you show it up? Why? Why? Why, why, why ethics? Maybe we can, maybe you can sort, uh, sort of frame this a little bit for us. What that, that's a really big question, but what is ethics in, in relationship to design slash service design for you? Okay. Um, so I think ethics comes up for uh, me and I'm, um, as you said, for many of your, um, guests who you had on your show and, um, I would imagine, uh, I would like to think for everybody who is designing because, um, uh, I really worry about how design tends to, um, well, it's really good at selling itself, um, it, to affirm its own values to, um, businesses and, and society, you know, so who says no to good design? Mm -hmm. But I think design expresses um, certain social priorities and it carries cultural values. Um, and, and often these values are, are invisible, but they become inscribed or hard-baked into the design process as an outcome. So, um, so I worry about what when design is assumed automatically as being good or it's useful. Um, and uh, and whether it's a method or a process or a system of product, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what it's actually doing, um, and that's that's why the the question of ethics is always about the why for me. Um, yeah, yeah. So we had the the conversations usually um, are around that uh, designers are quite positive people. They tend to look at the. Uh, uh, positive aspects of the design process. And uh, now that the questions and that the topic of ethics is being raised, it's, it's sort of like invites designers to take a step back and also think about maybe the, um, not the downsides, but the side effects of their work. Is that also like the way you're thinking about ethics? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think my worry is partly because service design has become so powerful uh, through its effectiveness and it's, um, uh, you know, coincided with that um, shifts in economies from manufacturing to services and the rise of this, the cheaper and the faster accessible digital technologies. So service design has become so much more powerful um, because it, it, it can kind of then now span geographies, mm -hmm. um, and uh, social cultural boundaries, um, it's you know it's accessibility, um, and so it penetrates into our lives much more deeply. Um, and we might I don't think we quite know the impacts of how far and how deep those um, uh, values penetrate until many years down the track. And that's what I think we, for me at least we need to sort of build a culture that allows us to question a lot more of these things before and during our designing. And what my question would be like that, um, I think, I hope a lot of people listening and watching would agree with that. Um, there is a bot. They run into practicalities. Like if you're running, if you're doing commercial projects, there's usually it feels like there's little time to deliberate around these topics. Like, what have you found? Is is that the biggest barrier, or is it just lack of knowledge? And how do we cope with that? Yeah, I I understand and. I think um, what seems to be happening um, and what you say, Mark, about the pragmatics being a, a big barrier, I sure. guess. Yeah. I think, I think maybe um, the form of the dominant designing that we, we have inherited 
still carries that legacy from the time where um, quicker was better. When um, and I think when you were mass producing objects, perhaps um, certain things could have been done that way. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of very sort of cookie cutter way. But I think given that service design now reaches into um, people's behaviors, how people imagine, experience things, that, that then requires all of us to um, slow down, to, to, to uh, do, do um, due diligence in um, not just the research, but to actually also um, talk with enough people who um, may potentially be um, implicated in the, the delivery and the impact of mm. certain services. And, and those things take time and those things are, are additional skills and capacities that um, the traditional disciplines of design didn't really have have before. So we're now, you know, we're now starting to see that and the methods and the processes that are coming in to support that. Um, and I think ethics is a is a is a string that ties it all together, actually. So mm. it, it always in accompaniment of um, the uh, actions that we were doing. But in order for us to sort of uh, think about um, the actions, who we speak with, whose values are privileged over others, how we negotiate them, they are um, very complex. So uh, they're not they're not quite like choosing between materials, which mm -hmm. is you know mm -hmm. the traditional design used to be. The, these things are quite um, invisible and very nebulous. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that 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 demands a, a, a different kind of sensitivities um, for designers moving forward into this space. What I feel that is emerging is that. Um, working with ethics and in embedding the ethical discussion in your design process is a fundamental uh, responsibility of a designer. And we're sort of starting to address that now that it's just like, if you don't um, consider your values, your morals, like how you make choices, you're basically not doing good design, uh, which is, I think, a very positive way forward and the other thing is that i think a lot of designers struggle around ethics because it's not part of the education like we talk a lot about the design process the, the methods but not a lot of designers i think maybe including myself probably um, have taken the effort to make their values and norms at, explicit and and use that in their design process right so if you don't know what your what your values are or like how you make choices it's really hard to do something around ethics yeah no you're absolutely right mm. and i think what also adds a further complication is that if you belong to either the dominant culture or you're designing for um a specific group of people um and as i said service design tends to perhaps um, go beyond those um, initially intended users, as we know, because that because services and digital technology evolve through its use. Um, and so values um, tend to be highlighted when it encounters difference. Mm. So you know that certain things matter to you when there is a difference in those values. So mm. it's actually quite difficult to notice what your values are if you're within a, a a dominant culture where everybody sort of shares those things um, and only um, start to recognize what those values you hold and even what values matter to you until those things are um, not, mm. not sort of meant in a kind of, you know, sort of um, antagonistic way, but in uh, composition of many others. And I think this shift into um, a diversity or understanding um, different different value systems and being able to accommodate that, I think is another uh, challenge that, again, being brought on by globalization, but also how, um, yeah, and how, and this goes back to the question of ethics, that I think personally design, the dominant form of design tends to privilege certain kinds of values, actually. So 
<laughs> things that are quicker, things that are bigger, things that are more um, convenient, you know, cheaper, whatever. And I would be curious, and I'm uh, inviting the people uh, from the community to comment on this. Maybe there are some smart design methods and tools that help us to make our values explicit. Like you said, probably we don't fully see them when we're in the dominant culture. Maybe somebody, probably somebody already has a method in place which helps us uh, to, to make that more explicit. And if there's, please leave there, leave a comment. Um, for now, I'd like to sort of wrap up the conversation about ethics and move into the second topic. Uh, are you okay with that? Yeah, of course. Okay, because this will be an interesting one as well. It's the topic of bridges. <clears throat> and I see you searching for a good question starter. So let's give it a go. Oh, so Mark, um, is this like a wild card? Yes, it is. Three dots. It's absolutely a wild card. Okay. So my wild card was a question to you. Um, and um, you sort of mentioned how you had 98 people yes. on your show. Yes. You probably interviewed more than that, but the ones that's been yeah. published would have been 98. I'd like to know how many people um, of diverse cultures and backgrounds were um, on your show. Mm. That's interesting. It doesn't happen to me that often that the guests actually start asking me questions, but I'll do my best to <laughs> to play along. So um, I think we have to sort of think about what is the, um, you said non-dominant uh, culture, right? So people from uh, non-Europe, non-US, and preferably non-male, right? That That would be like the dominant do dominant design culture. I think uh, if I would have to uh, give a number, it may it's probably between 25 and 35. So let's say a third of the guests were probably, meh, maybe a, a bit more, but 30%, 30 mm. to 40%. And how many of them were from um, regions outside of Europe and US? Yeah, like, so that that would be for me like the the thirty two to forty percent. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious about. Um, so the the question, well, the question, the, the theme was around bridges. Yes. And um, one of the things that uh, I'm quite passionate about is how design can. When we talked about this in ethics mm. around. Uh, accommodating or embracing diversity and um, it, it comes from the the premise that I have but also I guess uh, discussions in particular actually not in service design though but in other um, um, fields uh, where de design and many other fields are recognized as being dominated by certain um, particular worldview, usually they're called Western in a sure. sort of yeah. hegemonic yeah. Um, even though Western cultures in itself is very diverse. Um, but it, I think it's it's a convenient shorthand that speaks to how certain um, norms are mm -hmm. um, put into the center of a particular field and design is definitely one of them. So um, uh, I, d I didn't say myself in my introduction, but I am Japanese um, and I have, um, uh, I'm a product of a family who migrated uh, quite frequently, actually every five years ow owing to my, my father's work situation. Um, and, uh, and so the reason why I speak the way I do and I now live in Australia is partly f because of this, um, quite a mixed bag of experiences while growing up. Um, even though for me, I very strongly still identify as being Japanese and um, mm -hmm. I like to think uh, I still asso uh, associate with a certain um, social, cultural and spiritual dimensions of um, 
Japanese people. Anyway, so what, what that has provided me with is um, a teaching that I didn't actually receive in my Western education um, around uh, the kinds of designing that um, Japanese cultures have been doing for um, a lot longer than the short history of the industrial mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. period um, that are shaped by um, certain kinds of uh, materialities, uh, worldviews, beliefs, histories, um, to, to, be, to become and to be made relevant to that local context and situations. So um, I am um, always in, embodying this identity um, as I speak to people um, like yourselves. And my um, role in my life has has been a lot around building those bridges between it could it could even be simply around communication so it's it's not by accident that you and I had to learn English and its proficiency it's also not by accident that we had to learn certain other cultural norms in order for us to um, conduct professional things in um, in mm -hmm. international or whatever contexts um and so i am i'm really starting to um wonder and um i guess advocate and this also ties to um serve Desk 2020 which we were hoping to host and we were still hoping to host is um how much is um still uh invisible or um lacking um recognition of, of design and also service design practices that are um, not from yeah. a particular yeah. place. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. so <clears throat> I think that's, um, that is so a topic that's definitely on my mind when inviting guests and creating a show to, to, to be a mirror of the global community which the service design community is it's uh, when when i started doing the show a whole world opened up for me and i really realized that it, the community is much bigger much more diverse and, and colorful than you might see when you look at the books that you can buy on amazon around this topic so it's definitely something on my mind and i don't know who mentioned it but <clears throat> What I a phrase that I liked is that there are different flavors of service design. Like there's a Brazilian flavor and there's probably a Chinese flavor of service design. And uh, putting that forward and um, uh, sharing that story is, I think, really enriching. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I might even uh, go so far as saying how... Um, there is a lot more I personally am learning from um, being exposed to um, and learning from uh, pr not just practitioners, but academics, uh, philosophers um, around what these um, diverse practi practices or approaches can teach us. So when I, I guess I'm sort of um, pushing back a little bit on the flavor notion of it being um you know like a rainbow color thing mm -hmm. where, um for example um uh the current condition uh of the, the the unsustainable consumption that we we're in is is design cannot deny its role in that um and i i also have learned that there are, there are economies that had flourished um by actually not taking uh, the the land or the resources as a human ownership, and so there's quite different worldviews in which humans see their relationship to its to each other and to mm -hmm. its environment. And again, because design expresses and prioritizes certain values, certain values from a certain place that um, sees nature as their resource accelerates that it makes it more powerful and that's what we see through industrialization whereas there's other forms of designing that had always has all also flourished and created um uh very uh um sustainable economies of trade um without that being a result and um and 
Australia is a, is a great example of that. It's 65,000 years of a sustainable and flourishing uh, civilization uh, of Indigenous nations. So this is where I feel um, that there is a lot that um, regions that where I'm in and living in can um, uh, even, I would dare to say, uh, lead lead the way that design can go um, and uh, enable us all to learn um, and re-inscribe the way, I guess, the dominant design has been um, mm. taught to us through textbooks. Sure. Um, and uh, what we can then start to shift our, uh, not just mindsets, but our entire relationships to um, to one another and the, the whole ecology, and um, in looking to shape futures. Shaping futures, um, and I, I I like your pledge for building bridges and adopting and learning about different worldviews, uh, which which is I think really enriching for the de design practice, but. You said something about shaping our future. So, and that's a really uh, good lead way, lead in to the final and third topic, which is called shaping our practice. Uh, do you have a question starter around that one? Yeah, uh, I think you what might is, be what. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, I guess it, it'd be in sort of, in this time, and um, for viewers who might be watching this, I don't know, a year later or something, I, I just want to say how we're actually in a very unprecedented pre time where we're, we're, the whole world is in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. And this is, I've never experienced this in my lifetime. Um, and uh, the cultural memory of people have, having lived through this of, of mostly gone so um it's it's teaching so we can't not think about this basically that's what sure. i'm trying to say yeah. um in terms of futures right and um and i'm trying to um think about um not not seeing this as um you know like a really bad thing even though it's terrible in terms of the number of cases and deaths but i think it's also um a teaching moment or something for us to learn from in a sense of how it, it sort of touches on um, the two things we talked about around ethics and about worldviews is how it's, I think we've arrived at this moment because um, uh, the dominant industries have disrupted ecosystems through mining and clearing urbanizations, the population growth, unsustainable economic development. And it's brought the, the, the humans in contact with these species where these viruses had come from. And and there's reports about how, um, you know, because of our, the travel bans and people not um, driving to work anymore, that there's the, the quality of the air is improving in major cities like the UK and China. Um, and maybe this, it's not peer reviewed yet, but perhaps this might be a way to think about how we might reduce carbon emissions mm. in the future. And even though I don't think it's just totally sustainable um, for us to all stop traveling, um, I like I think it's a question for service design to think about because service design champions supposedly holistic and systemic changes. So what are we learning from this accidental and fearful public experiment? Um, so we can put the insights we learn from this experience back into how we redesign organizations like systems of governance, systems of commerce, flows of information. So we are able to work with key decision makers in each of these fields that we collaborate with so that we don't just go back to um, business as usual. Um, so that's what I like to um, think about as a what if. Mm. Um, and there's no answer, obviously. Maybe by the time we revisit this, six years, uh, six months or a year down the track, there might be a possibility, but that's something that I think we could we could collectively think about. So are you hoping or expecting that this will be like an incremental change or do you hope that it will be a more fundamental change to our practice? 
I'm a, I'm going to be erring towards a fundamental change, partly because the, the, the disruption has been so significant. And so a lot of the norms and um, the business as usual have been questioned. I can't, I can't really imagine people slotting back to how things used to be because how things used to be is not the way we want things to be anymore. We don't want um, the pressures on the healthcare system that collapses in this way and vulnerable people not be, being able to be supported. You know, these are, these are questions that are universal now because of our single common united problem. Um, I, yeah, so, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious, like, um, when we were preparing uh, this interview, you, you mentioned something about uh, rising above, uh, like, the individual and thinking about the practice as a, as a whole, as a community. Mm. I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what, what that might be. And, of course, that's, like, the what-if question. But what, where do you hope this... Um, it, what is the compass for our field? What is the if the direction? Um, that's the million dollar question, I guess. I know, and but I, yeah, <laughs> your your gut feeling. It's like yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, what? Yeah, what if? So, what if? Um, let's see. I'm I'm part because of my experience and part because I'm Japanese. I'm you know I'm biased towards the power of a, of the collective in the sense that I think collectives can make quite wise decisions. And I don't really know whether service design as a community globally talk about this in a kind of a UN style. I don't even though UN as an organization and system is also very fraught as well. But it, it, it could be ways in which um, people like ourselves step out of our normal jobs and the boundaries in which we are operating within to think about a collaboration across scale in, the, in this sense. I don't know whether that's possible. Um, uh, I also think uh, we could try and prototype a lot of ideas that we generate in, the, in, our, in our own communities and local organisations and start to share them. Um, but again, um, you know, there are conferences and having been in, um, in sort of uh, busy organising one, conferences are, themselves are quite political as well. So um, well, I don't know what platform would be most suitable for, for this sort of sharing. Um, maybe it, it might need to be something that's online, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. accessible to all. Um yeah, and uh, yeah, and maybe I don't know. Like a third one would be. Um, it kind of goes back to um, the sort of questions we had at the beginning about how do we know what we're doing is is um, the way we should be going mm -hmm. is in ethics, um, and the the frame of references we have again is so bound up by the immediacy of the needs and the requirements of our jobs or, or and I wonder what it is that we can do to help one another loosen some of those boundaries to have um, almost like a friend who can advocate with you on certain things for for change for really important changes to be made I don't know how we can lend our support and um, expertise and influences that way I don't know this is me just thinking on this sure. speaking yeah out. <laughs> and there are a lot of people listening and watching right now. So I hope some of them are inspired to uh, join you in this thinking, because I think these are interesting and really important topics as well. Uh, yeah. What I well, see. What, what, yeah. What do you think, Mark? Well, uh, I feel like I'm in a privileged situation to talk to people like you who are thinking about these things and sort of pick your brain. And then what happens for me is that I start to recognize patterns. I start to recognize mm -hmm. patterns among people from various backgrounds, various expertise, various parts of the world. And when those people individually start talking about a specific thing like ethics, then that's a really 
clear indicator for me that our field is heading into that direction. Mm, mm. So I, yeah, like I said, ethics is, for instance, one of the things that that has been coming up lately quite often, and um, the 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 importance of um, if maybe having a manifesto or something like like taking your responsibility as a designer bringing mm. that into our field is definitely something that's on the agenda but there are more uh, and I, I hope that people listening again will sort of be able to extrapolate their own patterns from these conversations because I'm watching and listening to this from my own lens and my own background but I'm sure that if you would listen to 10 conversations you would see other things so that's a mm. long answer to your question <laughs> Mm, yeah, yeah. And I think I'd like to um, see whether, because I think you have a lot of influence, Mark, partly through the popularity of this show. You mentioned like 2,000 people might be watching it or something. Um, so i like to try and see whether we can calibrate the balance between the 30% um, becoming maybe 50% or 60%. And how, partly because... Um, the it's so easy to fall back to listening to the same people again and um mm. the 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 people i'm inspired by don't often get that opportunity partly by the positioning that they're in and partly for all sorts of reasons um yeah and yeah. i would really love to see whether that's possible so that your platform then becomes a place where we would all learn, then be able to learn and have a a mutual dialogue mm. around shared concerns and 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 i would like to extend your your call as a call to the community because i'm uh i'm partially dependent on the people who sort of are brought to my attention and the more people from diverse backgrounds are brought to my attention that will be reflected in the show so people please help me out uh, to make this show even more diverse. So let's mm. see what happens. <laughs> well, I'm, I've got 30 people I can recommend. Let, let's go. We, we, we're almost approaching episode 100. So after that, we're going to continue for the next 100 as well. Yoko, uh, we're entering the final stage of this chat, but I and I'm really curious, do you have a, you already posed a few questions, but do you have a question for us, the people listening and watching to the show that we can think upon? next to the questions that you already asked us? Um, uh, no, but I like to um, sort of, uh, I guess, um, call attention to the conference we're organizing. Um, well, the date still hasn't been set, served as 2020. And the, and the theme that we've selected is um, tensions, paradoxes and plurality. And the reason why um, those themes were nominated was partly in recognition for the times that we're living and the rec and also the acknowledgement and perhaps some of the worry about service design not stepping into these spaces enough to not neatly bound things um, too much and to sort of expose uh, the, yeah, the tensions, paradox and plurality of in accompaniment that comes with uh, the work we do. Mm. And um uh if you're watching um we are still trying to aim for a hybrid conference so if the travel ban continues we'd really like um people uh if you're watching this wherever you are to participate via online we haven't quite worked out the details yet um but uh the peer-reviewed papers are fantastic uh, we also had um prepared i mean in fact mark the people i was thinking of for you to speak to are already on our panel nice. um <laughs> conference yeah so um that could be another great way to sort of give another introduction to whet their appetite you know of um, what might follow through a conference um and they're really inspiring speakers and practitioners so um i'd love to invite you to um uh participate at, as and when you can um in a dialogue that uh, we're hoping to have I'll, I'll make sure. Yeah, I'll make sure to put all the relevant links either on the screen somewhere or down below in the video show notes or the episode show notes. So um, yeah, if people want to continue this conversation with you specifically, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, I guess an email. Mm -hmm. I'll make mm. sure it's somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, we also have a um, like a Slack service design network thing. Um, specifically, which... specifically for Melbourne or the general uh, service design network Slack. Oh, um, so the one that we run is a service. It's called Service on Melbourne, but we've sure. got like three thousand members, which I'm sure is wow. not more. Um, and there's different channels in there that talks about ethics and um, public sector stuff and whatnot. Um, the link to the Slack channel will be on the screen here as well. So if people are invited, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, let's put up it's right here. So yeah, somewhere over there. Um, I think we have to wrap this up. Uh, Yoko, thanks for sharing uh, really valuable and important topics uh, that I hope that we can keep addressing here on the show. So thank you for making the time and uh, good luck with the conference this year. Great, thank you. So if you'd like to be part of Surfdesk 2020, make sure you check out the links that are down below uh, in the video show notes, the episode show notes. If you enjoyed this episode with Yoko and found the topics that we've discussed interesting and important, make sure to grab the link and share it with just one other person today who might enjoy it as well. That way you'll help to grow the Surf Design Show community and that helps me to invite more interesting and inspiring guests like Yoko for you here on the show. If you want to continue, we can do that. Check out this video because that's the next video that will help to level up your service design skills. So click over here and I'll see you over there.